Welcome to December's 2019 Stock and Flock Talk. We're, um, I'm proud to present uh, Dr. Dave Wilson, our Extension uh, Dairy Veterinarian. And he'll be talking about uh, causes of bovine mortality from some data at the Utah Veterinary Diagnostic Lab. Dr. Wilson. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so Savannah Gucho is a third year student up at Pullman now in Washington State. Last summer, she was a summer intern with me and helped a lot with this. And a lot of the individual diagnostic confirmations we did with Tom Baldwin, the director of the UDL. And yeah, you can see it's, it's over almost a 12 year period inclusive. Okay, why is that not behaving itself? Yeah, so what we wanted to do was look at the causes of death of cattle at necropsy that came in here. And UVDL, and you'll see in a minute that the reason we chose these time intervals, these years, is that's the, the LIM system, the laboratory information management system that we have, goes back to 2008. And we wanted to help the owners and vets uh, look at some of the most likely causes of death in cattle by age group and help prioritize management and prevention as well as the diagnostic differential diagnoses. Um, so in terms of methods, we have just over 2,250 cases that came in here. And I'll just say a little bit about VADS. VADS is the VETSTAR Animal Disease and Diagnostic System. It's the Lab Information Management System. And just for what it's worth, a lot of these Lab Information Management Systems, you can spend hundreds of thousands of dollars, many hundreds of thousands sometimes on getting these, which is kind of crazy. And if you have like um, upgrades or extra work that needs to be done, they can also run into hundreds of thousands of dollars. Whereas VADS has some cumbersome features but it's starting to gain a lot of traction at a lot of labs because it costs like tens of thousands of dollars a year. And it, it, it isn't uncommon that it has something to run a report or something doesn't work right, but we can call one of two people in New Jersey and usually the same day or the next day, a lot of times the same day, they're responsive. So it's very affordable. So what we do with VADS here is it makes an Excel database of its own, but it's kind of cumbersome. So we take all the data and put it on our own expanded Excel spreadsheet and analyze it both using Excel itself and also RStudio. The diagnoses are actually determined by either testing for specific pathogens like by culture, um, PCR, uh, immunohistochemistry, things like that, direct observation of the pathogens such as parasites, for example, or microscopically, histologically seeing the bacteria, viruses, whatever, uh, and a combination of those things. One thing we wanna make clear about this is the diagnoses are um, not reflective of anything that's obvious on the farm. Something like uh, hemorrhage, a major injury, a prolapsed uterus or something like that, that's not coming in here. Um, but it is reflective of all these things that get submitted where they don't know what killed the animal and they'd like to know. Um, just for what it's worth, um, in many species of animals and birds, there isn't anything published in referee journals for 25 years or more in North America on things like what is the causes of mortality in uh, sheep, uh, goats, pheasants, whatever it is. And so we do those kind of papers from time to time. Um, and also sometimes people point out and say, look, hey, this is, uh, this is just what's submitted to a lab and what's unknown uh, when it comes in. Well, um, you also have to consider that 99.9 .9 something percent of farm animals and birds that die on farm don't even get a gross postmortem. So it's a great missed opportunity. So we're trying to summarize best we can here, the most common causes of death. As far as where these come from, of course, most of them are Utah and Idaho. Uh, this Pennsylvania here is billing information. So that's a billing address. But the rest of these, uh, including like Minnesota, Nebraska, et cetera, we actually get samples from there. And we get quite a few from Texas. And it's kind of interesting. Um, I really like working with the Texas Veterinary Medical Diagnostic Lab Network. But anytime people from Texas are willing to send you stuff from out of state, to your lab is kind of a nice compliment. So we get a lot of stuff from around the West, but most of it from Utah and Idaho. So in these animals, they range from 60 days in utero aborted fetuses to 12 year olds, okay? And um, what we've got here is there are just under 400 fetuses. And in a nine month gestation, uh, the average fetal age is about seven months. These are third trimester a lot. And basically what you see here is that early abortions, we don't get very many at all because 
a lot of these early abortions are very small. And if they're, they're either resorbed or if they're actually expelled, they're usually not ever seen. So it's pretty uncommon that we get these, these really early stage fetuses. And a lot of these early ones are actually where there was an abortion happening within a cow for some other reason as well. So there might be sometimes a fatality diagnosis on a cow, but a previously occurring abortion within that cow. And whereas a lot of the fetuses we get are, you know, last trimester, last third of pregnancy, um, the bigger fetuses. Uh, we have just under just over 650 animals under one year old. And you see that their age and days over here, a whole lot of them are 100 or so days and, and younger, and particularly in the first month of life. And that, that makes sense. There's a lot more death loss in early baby calves. Um, and that's kind of where we get a lot of them. The one year old and older uh, still basically goes down by age because a lot of them don't tend to live a lot of bovines more than a few years. But one thing that we put in here is kind of interesting. The male to female ratio, we see this in all kinds of species of birds and animals. In, in many kinds of livestock, including bovines, you, you think that the value in the population is dominated by females. You would think there'd be a lot more female heifers and cows that would come in. But that first year of life, it's actually a little bit more male. And we have this in goats and sheep and a lot of other things. And it's just kind of interesting. And uh, we don't attempt to keep track of how many are steers. Um, we, don't, we don't always uh, record that versus intact bulls. But basically then you see that once they become the second year of life and older, as you might expect, females start to dominate. We get a lot more cows than males. Dr. Wilson? Yeah. How do you want to handle questions? We've got a couple coming in on the chat thing, or one. No, I don't. I actually as don't. we go, or do you want me to interrupt you? Or yeah, do I, I don't see him, so just let me know. Yeah. Oh, sure. So somebody asked uh, when you I think when you're talking about the distribution of the cases. Yeah. Did they send a whole dead cow from Texas? Oh, there's another great question. Um, not usually. So what that would be is they'll send us like calves in big boxes. They'll send us in aborted fetuses, or they'll send like um, liver, kidney, lung, uh, trachea, spleen, whatever. And, and then, of course, 99% of the time, pathologist says, this isn't everything I wish I had, right? Pathologist says, man, I wish I had more this organ or something. So they come in boxes of organs and tissues. Um, and, and a, a lot of times up through baby calf age, they send the whole thing. So they actually arrive you know, overnight. But not yeah. You know, usually just, don't send us a whole big carcass. Dave, this is Denise. I, this is just a. I mean, I, this is all so new to me. It's fascinating. So they ship, you know, um, carcasses and organs in like like they would ship human organs like in styrofoam coolers or I mean, it just as an like, odd question, how do they ship these things? Denise, is that you? Yeah, it's me. I'm just, oh, I don't see your name. That's Denise Stewartson. I'm fascinated um, by this. Yeah, so how do they, they, ship, they ship them? Carcasses? They ship them in, ideally, like styrofoam lined with cold packs and stuff. Okay. okay. All right. And then a lot of them come that way. Okay. And sometimes it's like a pill jar with a liver jammed into it with a little bit of alcohol is instead of formalin, which we prefer. And, you know, it comes in July by FedEx and it's not in too good a shape. So generally, those don't get processed very much and we can't always use them. We try. But so a lot of these come in like 10 parts formalin to one part mass okay. of the organ sliced up. Uh, okay. So it'll be a big container of formalin with other stuff in it, uh, and or they'll be uh, frozen with cold packs inside styrofoam and they'll just arrive frozen. And then a lot of times we have to wait a day. So a lot of the stuff we get frozen any time of year, um, it has to sit uh, and thaw for a day before we post it. So Dave, her, 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 she's running incognito today. Her little name there is Utah. In yeah, the AITC, right. AITC. Yeah, yeah, I figured yeah. that. All right. So more questions? I don't I don't see the chat. Are we ready to roll on a little bit? Let's see. Did I yes? So this is just something I wanted to show you guys over here quickly. Most of the stuff that comes in, the people can't tell us anything. So they haul it here. We get a lot that's dropped off and hauled in from far to near. And a lot of times they may work on the farm or be in the farm family or both but they can't tell us anything. History. So at the front window where we accession, we don't know if it's Holstein or what it is, okay? So what happens is a lot of times the breed information comes in the back room by us identifying it. So 
If it's dairy, we can usually tell Holstein, Jersey, Guernsey, whatever. Whereas if we can't tell, it behaves like the beef. For example, the sex is a lot more 50-50 at all ages in the beef, especially the younger ones, whereas the dairy is always dominated by heifer calves and, and cows, okay? So this is just one little example. In a lot of ways, the things we see in this data convinces us that if we don't know the breed, it's probably beef because we can spot the Holsteins, Jerseys, et cetera. So here over in the breeds then, there's still a bunch of other that we don't know what they are. But you can see we have this in other data too out here in Utah. We're in Angus state. It's about three quarter black Angus and between black and red Angus, it's 80%. We've got some Herefords, some Simmentals and then things like Marquegianas, Caninas and Crosses and stuff is the other. Whereas in dairy, this is kind of interesting. A lot of our other data out here is very similar to the whole rest of North America. Pretty consistently, it's 95% Holstein, 4% Jersey, and 1% other. We have 89% Holstein, 9% Jersey. Jerseys are double represented here. And Jerseys are popular out here because they do well in the heat, but it doesn't change the fact that they're not usually considered to be more than maybe four, maybe 5% of the cows. So if you're one of those people who doesn't like Jerseys, then you say they die more. I'm not convinced of that, but for whatever reason, Jerseys are overrepresented. And we've speculated on this. We do know that some of the clients that send us a lot of stuff, some of the big farms that send us a lot of stuff have a lot of jerseys. So they're a little bit overrepresented. But you can see the dominant dairy breeds. And there's a few, um, uh, what do you call, um, Ayrshire's and uh, uh, Guernsey's and stuff in here, but mostly. So we've got just a few breeds that dominate. And you also see that we don't have very many white faces. When I moved here, I thought that was cancer eye with the bright sun, but there's a long time tradition in Utah that a white faced cow brings 20 or $30 less than a cow with a dark face. So we, we don't have as many white faces out here. So let's look at some of the main causes overall. Abortion, about one sixth of them. And idiopathic is a fancy way of saying we don't know what caused it. And if that seems bad, many labs will have like 70 some percent of their abortions undiagnosable because fetuses are inherently rotten. Fetuses are decaying uh, even before they're expelled usually. Infectious causes dominate, but congenital is about one eighth of them, deformities and things. And then once they're born alive, oh, dystocia is kind of interesting. This means they come in here and calving difficulty, dystocia is what killed them, but no one knows that. So a handful of these are cows who come in. We want to know what, why this cow died. And internally you see uh, like uterine rupture, uterine artery rupture, bad peritonitis from dystocia from a torn uterus or something, and they didn't know. And then quite a few of these are the calves. And what happens is we can see hemorrhage under the skin, hemorrhage up by the cranium, and often a ruptured liver, uh, like a basically a, a broken into liver capsule uh, from difficult birth killed the calf, and then they didn't know it. GI disease like diarrhea is dominant here, very big numbers, and pneumonia. And I think anybody who's familiar with, with uh, cattle disease, not a surprise that gastrointestinal pneumonia is big too. Cryptosporidium, we're gonna talk more about, big one. Rotavirus, coronavirus, E. coli, the classic major pathogens here. And in pneumonia, certainly Mannheimia and Pasteurella, and we're gonna talk more about that as well later. Over here in this table on the right, you see that there's undetermined, about 6%. And then there's a bunch of different diseases that have two or 3% of the total that are causes. Omphalitis is navel ill or an infected navel. Bloat, uh, where the rumen's all blown up. Perforation of the abomasum. And, that we always kind of tend to think of as a dairy calf disease. Dairy calves can get this thing where we see these burns from overheated, too hot milk replacer, generally in the winter time. And they start this ulceration and perforation. But actually, if you look at this data, it's not that different between beef and dairy. That surprised me. Congenital deformities, uh, the traumatic reticular peritonitis is hardware disease, where they swallow something sharp, all kinds of things, wires, needles, you can, pieces of twisted metal and it can penetrate into the heart sac from the reticulum stomach. Emaciation is kind of an interesting one. Emaciation is where uh, the main diagnosis is they don't have any body fat left. Um, they, you go in there and it's like, there's just no body fat. And sometimes we can't tell any more than that. It's not usually the underlying cause, it's starvation, but that's essentially what they died of. And then heart disease, like uh, heart valve infections. Let's look more at the abortions. And again, about half can't be diagnosed. Of the infectious, it's dominated by viral and bacterial, but protozoa is making an, uh, an increase in that, and that's Neospora over here, Neospora caninum, we'll talk about, and then again, congenital deformities. 
the virus thing, for as long as we've been identifying viruses for 60 years or more, IBR, infectious bovine rhinitis tracheitis, is a major abortion cause. And I still find that surprises a lot of people. Um, and IBR is really kind of one of the giants of diagnosable viral causes, along with bovine viral diarrhea. And then here's Neospora that we're going to talk more about. Basically comes from feces of dogs that eat any part of dead livestock. If dogs eat any part of dead livestock and defecate around the feed, you get Neospora protozoan. And then the bacteria, E. coli, Truparella, et cetera. One thing about the bacteria here, a lot of them, we can observe the bacteria histologically. We can tell it's bacterial. We can't grow it, pure culture, because the fetuses are too decayed. And so what's interesting about this little list of pathogens, E. coli, Truparella, Campylobacter mycoplasma, they're part of a couple other disease complexes. Just for fun, Dr. Rude, does this group of pathogens make you think of maybe any other disease complex of cattle? When you look at that list of bugs right there, especially think of E. coli and mycoplasma. What else do they cause? This is Jane mastitis for sure. And yeah, mastitis and or metritis, yes. And so what's going on here is this is a typical example of where many times paraparturian cows that die uh, or have abortion problems concurrently may have mastitis with the same pathogen. And it's speculated that either leaks down the escutcheon at the back of the vulva and vagina, trickles down to the udder and gets in there, or sometimes it comes from the great arteries and veins that drain from the uterus down ventrally downward into the gland. So it's kind of an interesting bunch of pathogens, uh, even though uh, if you calculate this out, there are like 70 some uh, or 80 some bacterial cases, and a lot of them aren't shown here because we can't grow the bug more definitively because it's too rotten. So here's birth to five days old, and I really pushed to have this category in here. This is neonates. So as we look at these neonatal ones, when the age is provided, GI is big, diarrhea and that sort of thing, but congenital abnormalities is the next biggest. And then navel ill, umbilitis, umbilical infection, then respiratory. And then if we look at the GI alone, E. coli, the biggest one, BVD, rota and corona. This one really surprised me. Cryptosporidium is defined here by the pathologist as the major cause of death. And yet they're kind of young for that. And we're gonna talk more about that, but crypto is usually seen in like one week old, five, six, seven, eight day old animals or older, typically one to three weeks old, but it still shows itself here. Now here's birth to weaning age with a weight proxy. And here's the thing, most of our animals, almost all of them get a body weight, they're supposed to, but a lot of times we're not provided with an age. So what we do in all of these kind of necropsy summary things in all species, we match up the ones who have an age to the body weight and come up with an age estimate that fits the best based on the ones that have both. And so for dairy, the best estimate we have of one to 50 days old is when they're up to 55 kilograms, which is about 120 pounds. Interestingly enough, if you go up to just a little bit over 120 pounds, the best fit for beef cows is one to 42 days old. So that got us looking in the data. That surprised me. What it starts to suggest is that early in life, beef calves are heavier than dairy calves. Whereas generally there's no, not even close, dairy animals tend to mature out uh, and grow up to be heavier than beef animals, often substantially so, especially considering Holsteins, the dominant ones. So we looked it up and you see that the dairy calves tend earlier in life to be lighter per age than the beef and pass them up and grow bigger. So here's our proxy by body weight. And if we look at these two different age ranges, but basically more or less birth to weaning age, GI disease really dominates. And I was surprised how much it dominated, 62%. Respiratory just getting started. Again, navel oil complications. That often includes, they get bloodstream infection and multiple arthritis and they die from it. Now, if we look at GI, we're going up to, uh, you know, uh, six weeks to two months old here, depending on the dairy or beef. Crypto is really rearing its ugly head. Rotavirus, Corona, E. coli, and Salmonella is starting to show up. Crypto we'll talk more about, but it is a very ubiquitous pathogen. And there's some evidence all over the world that maybe 80 to 90% of calves have cryptosporidium in their GI tract, uh, but a lot of them don't necessarily get sick, but a major um, diarrhea. 
four to five months old, weaning age to four to five months old, now you see a different proxy by body weight and age again. And unfortunately, the best fit, again, didn't equal the same days of age. For dairy calves, eight weeks to five months old, up to, and this number here is about 257 pounds, 150 kilogram. Similarly here in the beef cows, it goes up to four months old. They're best fit by body weight. And now we see a really nice even split between respiratory is coming on and GI disease. And then that abomasal perforation that we talked about a little bit, isn't just like a bottle fed too hot of milk disease. They often get this abomasitis, this bad infection, and then they, they die from their true stomach being infected. If we look at respiratory alone, now the two giants really start to show up, pasteurella and manheimia, pasteurella and manheimia. And again, a fair number of these also are, we can clearly observe bacteria and bacterial lesions, but it's not easy to culture it in pure culture because these are dead carcasses. If it's GI disease, now we start to see coccidiosis. Sarcina is a, like a, 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 a bug that's often in ulcers. Crypto again, E. coli, and coccidia is classically two months to a year old. And especially as they get more like four months old or so, it starts to show up. And we'll talk a little bit more about coccidiosis as well. Here's four to five months to one year old, a different proxy again. And now we basically can go up to a year old, really nice fit. And this is about 660 pounds is a good marker for up to a year old. And now we see respiratory is overtaking GI disease. And I think most of us would agree from experience that when animals start to get you know, beyond a few months old, we start to see less of diarrhea and enteritis killing them and more respiratory. Also bloat, where the rumen blows up and they, they die from it. Heart disease, a lot of this is endocarditis, infections of the heart valves. And I put toxicity in here because you can probably imagine that a lot of times, if people don't know what's killing their animals, one of the things they ask us is, is it poisoning? And sometimes they're actually concerned about like malicious poisoning, such as maybe somebody who's been fired or some person who's mad at them, but also put toxic plants in that and mistaken feed additives and things. And we have a, a very complete toxicology lab here. Many diagnostic labs vet don't anymore, but we do. And so we do diagnose toxicity, but it's not really one of the biggest ones. Now, if we look at the respiratory for these 70 calves from respiratory disease, we see again manheimia and pastorella, two big bacterial pathogens. Truparella starts to come in here. Uh, that was called Arcanobacterium and then Actinomyces before that, pyogenes. Bovine respiratory syncytial virus starts to show up. And these are actually respiratory salmonella. So salmonella as a GI type of uh, disease sometimes is systemic and makes problems that way. Now, one to four year old, now for the first time, the fit is the same. It's uh, about 660 pounds to 1,100 pounds. 302 to 499 kilograms is a nice proxy for one to four year old. And you can bet that we wanted to look at one to two year old, two to three year old, three to four year old, like that, right? Because we said, hey, you know, as cows get to be a mature adult at about two years old, have their first calf, 30 months old, whatever, they're, they're gonna be different. And they were so alike that it didn't even matter. So between one and four years old is just really similar. Respiratory disease, the single biggest one, undetermined hardware, where they eat the wire or the nails or whatever, the needles. Um, the, some of the stuff I found inside cows is unbelievable. I mean, you'll see that they went and got a hold of some vet's bag or something while they had it open, and they chewed up a whole bunch of monojack needles or something. And, and that's where it penetrates into the heart sac and they get reticular peritonitis. GI disease is smaller. Now we start to see metritis, uterine infections. And again, this is the single most common group where the best thing we can tell them is, hey, they got no body fat left. They died of, they essentially starved at the end. And sometimes within that, we can find pathogens, sometimes not. The respiratory, yep, manheimia and pasteurella, two big ones here. E. coli, this is kind of an interesting one. This is Escherichia e. coli, the GI bug, being attributed as the cause of pneumonia. But one of the things that makes E. coli challenging is sometimes it's very hard to tell E. coli that looks like it's killing them in the lungs from postmortem overgrowth. So there's probably some of that. Truparella, Histophilus, that used to be called Haemophilus for years, Somni shows up, and bovine respiratory syncytial virus. So mostly bacteria. And again, when we have viral pathogens in a lot of species, including cows, viruses can do a lot of bad things. But most of the time, not always, if we're going to kill them, 
is going to be complicated by bacteria coming in. They'll be the killer. These kind of cases is where the virus just, I mean, BRSV can, can kill them fast, bovine respiratory syncytial virus. We're going to talk a little bit more about prevention of all this stuff. Now, our last category, four years and older, almost 200 animals. We have the same weight proxy. Basically, everybody over 500 kilograms, 1,100 pounds, fits into the four years or older category. That surprised me, that, that 1,100 pounds was a, such a good predictor of four years old and older. Because um, for Holsteins, it probably alone it wouldn't be. Respiratory, GI, hardware, bloat, metritis, and neoplasia. A lot of different categories now. Respiratory, GI, and hardware, the big ones. Hardware always kind of surprised me in this data set how the reticular peritonitis from hardware was such a big killer. Uh, this is tumors, or generally cancer, uh, going here. And it's almost all lymphoma, also known as bovine leukosis, bovine leukemia. So basically, it's the lymphoma of bovine leukemia. And what will happen is um, one of the things that happens with bovine leukosis that you never want to be totally mystified by is one eye or the other will start to stick out forward. It's not keratitis. It's not pink eye or anything in the eye. It's the eyeball starts to stick out. And what's going on is there's a retrobulbar mass in the eye socket behind the eye. And it's growing, shoving the eye out. And that's usually one of the ways that lymphoma will start showing up. And other times in the paralumbar fossa up here, in front of the wing of the ilium, there'll be little, uh, little swellings, little half inch wide little bumps. And if you dissect them, they have it all through the GI tract. I, I left these single tumors in here just just to leave them here, but they're basically oddball things. And I mean, they're, they're one case each. Um, this is a blood-borne sarcoma. This is a liver cancer, hepatocellular carcinoma. Scirrus carcinoma, I can never remember. Every time I ask Tom Baldwin, he explains it to me, and then I forget what that is. It's an odd tumor. And granulosa cell tumor, that's in the ovary. This is an ovarian cancer in a lot of different species. Can be very, very life-threatening. But they just don't, but the lymphoma, Glucosis shows up here. Okay, now I, I'm going to go on into some con control measures. Um, I don't know if we have any any questions right now. Uh, if not, um, we'll move on into control. No, it looks good. Move on. Okay, so abortions. One thing that's really important: you want to keep cattle and dogs away from aborted fetuses, placentas, and discharge. Now that can be hard to do, especially out in the range, but it's worth mentioning. Uh, you don't want the cows licking up the discharge. You don't want you know cows in the same pen having access to a bunch of different placentas. And you know how dogs eat about anything. When, when you got dogs eating things like this, uh, there's a lot of things they can spread, but that includes Neospora. If dogs can eat any part of dead livestock, the dog feces can carry Neospora caninum. And so keeping dog feces away from where cattle eat is always worth trying to do. As far as vaccine, we want to vaccinate against infectious bovine rhinotracheitis and bovine viral diarrhea. And that means we want a combination vaccine of IBR, BVD, PI3, which is perinfluenza 3, BRSV, bovine respiratory syncytial virus, and leptospirosis 5 serovirus. There is a kind of a belief system out here in the West that here in the West we don't have lepto. We do. Anytime you have a lot of different species, including deer urinating in your water supply or in your fields or whatever, um, and sometimes dogs, for example, you're going to have lepto around. And so we want to use a nine-way vaccine. And in my experience, we want to at least do that every six months, not just annual. We also want to, by the way, vaccinate for brucellosis with the RB51 strain vaccine. And this isn't just for if you ever expect to move your cows interstate. Everybody should vaccinate for that. As far as enteritis, vaccination uh, has a little bit less demonstrated effectiveness for some things. But you don't want to miss E. coli, rota coronavirus, and clostridium. Now, one thing I always like to mention about E. coli vaccine, J5 and some of the other related mastitis vaccines, um, I actually did some of my PhD on J5 vaccine, and I worked with one of the guys who helped invent it years ago when he was at Cal Davis. J5 vaccine for mastitis to prevent cold form mastitis is pretty good stuff, but it will not cross protect against enteric E. coli. And people are sometimes still told that. So you want an enteric E. coli, rota corona, clostridium, and a lot of vaccines have all four of these combined. And again, for BVD, we want to catch that with the combined nine-way vaccine. Now, salmonella vaccines are certainly out there, and they're common that one of the things with salmonella vaccines, there's a lot of different places that'll say, 
we're going to make a Bactrin. If you send us like bulk tank milk, milk samples, feces from calves or pieces of GI tract or something that has salmonella from your farm, we'll make you a Bactrin for your farm. And it comes with a nice label and says, you know, the beef acres, Jones farm, whatever, and you get this salmonella Bactrin. They really haven't shown very much effectiveness. And I always tell people a control program for salmonella, I'm not sure that I could describe one without lying because I think that salmonella control can be very difficult. Um, certainly environmental sanitation and bedding changes and things like that. But salmonella is harder to control. And fortunately, it's relatively less common. And most of the outbreaks I've ever been involved with kind of play themselves out. But certainly these vaccines are important. Dave, this is Denise. I have a question for you, please. Yeah. So, you know, my students, I was meeting or met with them, my food literacy class, and they were asking about animal welfare. So I'm assuming that on an organic operation that, that don't vaccinate, that these death rates are higher? I mean, is that a proper um, assumption? Or? There are a few different rules for organic production. And there's a couple different major ones. The ones I know about, you can vaccinate. Uh, oh, you can? I'm not familiar. Does anybody know of organic rules where you can't vaccinate? No, you can I, vaccinate. Yeah. In fact, that's... They, they encourage you to, to vaccinate. There, it does get a little tricky with certain vaccines that have uh, different preservatives, yeah, but preservative as far antibiotic. as I understand, they're all, everything's golden with vaccination. Yeah. Oh, I, okay. Yeah, now, antibiotics are different though, right? Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Now, okay. now since, since you brought that up, well, here's something important. With any organic rules that I know of, and the organic farms I've worked with, particularly when I was still in upstate New York, and we worked with tons of farms in the program I was in. With organic, you can treat animals with a lot of different antibacterials, but what you're supposed to do then is either for like a lactating animal, take them out of organic production for the rest of lactation until after they go through dry period and cap again, or for like meat animals, if you, if you go to antibiotics for welfare reasons to treat them, then they're supposed to just be treated as non-organic. Right, okay. Well, after the withdrawal period and everything is over, which is okay. kind of an interesting Thank you. Uh, that's not totally logical, but that's what they do. But you can vaccinate, okay? Um, so let's talk a little bit about cryptosporidiosis because it's a very ubiquitous pathogen. We were saying that there's some evidence that 80, 90% of calves may have it in their GI tract. And I think Dr. Rood, you were telling me that this past year, a lot of the beef producers really had a lot of questions about crypto this past year. So the term crypt uh, is attributed to both Greek and Latin or both, and it means hidden. So when we talk about cryptography codes or in the crypt, it's hidden. Parvum means little in Latin. Cryptosporidium parvum means the sporulated hidden little thing. It's a small protozoan parasite of the intestinal cells. Whenever you see images all over the place of crypto histologically, it looks like the crypto is on the surface of the cells. Well, just how it happens, it's in the surface of the cells. Why does this matter? Diarrhea. I used to work with a guy who used to say, diarrhea is the brush that sweeps clean. Diarrhea is a very interesting uh, me method of dealing with GI infections. It has a downside of dehydration, can be very bad, but it's designed to kind of clean things out. Well, with cryptosporidium, you're not, you can't wash it off very much because it's in the surface of the cells and it really impacts uh, absorption of how nutrients are absorbed. Now, if you look at the host species, uh, it's quite a list, dogs, cats, pigs, sheep, goats, etc. monkeys, rabbits, and sometimes bovines are infected with other species besides part of them, but not usually, and some other controlled studies where they've given it to them have infected calves. So there's a lot of hosts of crypto around. One important thing is antibiotics don't really affect crypto, and they're actually associated with more death, lo death loss from an intestinal cell erosion. So we want to stay away from that. And we have a lot of interest in vaccines of crypto, many of them studied in mice, and they haven't been effective so far. If you can wash something, like depending on the housing your calves are in, if there's something you can clean, like calf hutches, et cetera, uh, a hot water wash of 140 degrees Fahrenheit and thorough drying is a really good way to clean that for a lot of pathogens, including crypto. Um, and of course, again, if there's range conditions and that kind of thing, this kind of thing is, isn't as applicable but at least changing bedding between every calf. Every calf, whatever kind of housing we're using that goes through that, we wanna to try to change bedding in between and keep in mind high pressure wash uh, for crypto. 
Again, it's typically five to 20 days old, but often seven to 13 day old calves. It kind of comes in after rotavirus, coronavirus, and E. coli in early life. And it has a sort of a, a yellow to gray, brown mustard to custard appearance. A lot of people describe it as looking sort of like, like brown mustard. Um, it's often kind of pasty. It's not usually, it can be, but it's not usually really runny or really kind of thick and dried. It has a typical smell of its own once you, once you know it. So once you kind of know how to smell it, you can kind of recognize it. To confirm it, you do fecal flotation and look at the oocysts, like here. The, now this is stained. Uh, the oocysts don't show up in color without stain, but you can still see them. Again, we want to not use antibiotics against crypto cases. And generally in a lot of diarrhea of ruminants, uh, you're not really needing antibiotics. So you want IV and oral fluids. They help um, to, to treat it instead of antibiotic. And I, I don't have a lot of dose information in here, but I wanted to put this part in. Kaolin and pectin, there's a, tons of brands of it, all kinds of brands of kaolin and pectin. You, use, you want to use at least two ounces, 60 mLs per calf, and a common dose is four ounces, and you can do it as often as every four hours. And it's certainly, you know, you don't want to just necessarily confine it to twice a day or something like that. But there's some things you can read out there that say use one ounce per calf. And let's not do that. Let's at least go two ounces per calf, uh, if not four ounces per calf, and do it frequently. It's also a zoonotic disease, as in uh, infectious from animals to people. By the way, zoonotic also means people to animals. And occasionally, humans can carry foot and mouth disease to animals. Because if you're ever around foot and mouth disease, you'll shed it in your breath for about 72 hours. So zoonotic means animal to humans or human to animals. But crypto is a classic zoonotic disease. The daycare, the preschool, the grade school goes out to visit the farm for goodwill, to have the kids get out to the calves and things, and they can get diarrhea. So as much as possible, we either want disposable gloves, even though for little kids, nitrile gloves are kind of too big for them. We want to keep that uh, sanitation gel ready and be aware of the fact that having, having children come around uh, ruminants, especially baby calves, um, can lead to crypto. And every year there's a few vet schools, usually different ones, but every year in North America, some of the vet schools will have the vet students in their 20s who've grown up away from the farm, most of them, and they'll be on food animal rotation and they'll get crypto and need to be IV'd and be hospitalized for a day or so. It's a very um, a kind of a, if you're not used to it uh, and get exposed to it, you can get it yourself. As far as pneumonia, we have to always talk about that adequate ventilation and shelter and a temperature range of 25 to 65 Fahrenheit is ideal for ruminants. There's just no substitute for good water feed, temperature and ventilation, but of course it's kind of hard to control in outdoor and range conditions. Um, we can vaccinate against some of these major pathogens, either cows or calves or both. The effectiveness is variable. In a lot of field trials, it hasn't been shown very protective, but in some it has. Uh, to me, I think it's worth giving it a try to vaccinate for manheimia, pasteurella, and histophilus. And again, this used to be, this used to also be pasteurella hemolytica, and histophilus was called hemophilus somnus. It was his old name. Um, and a lot of vaccines have these alone or in combination, including all three at once. Here's some things we don't have very much controlled study on. How many times a year should we do this? There's often a, a booster schedule of like booster in two or three weeks, give them two or three weeks apart. But how often per, should we do it? Should they be vaccinated for every time they go in moving or in shipment to the feedlot or to another facility or something and go get trailered around? I think so. Uh, from my background, which partly includes some immunology, uh, I think it's probably worth doing. And one thing we always want to try to keep in mind, if we can plan it this way, it's probably better that we don't vaccinate like the day before or the day of, that we do a bunch of other stressful things and then move the cows. If we can vaccinate them a week or 10 days ahead, it's probably a whole lot better. Uh, as far as pneumonia, the viral pneumonias, vaccines are well worth doing once again. And we did talk about these before under abortion, uh, some of the same major pathogens. So we want to vaccinate for infectious bovine rhinotracheitis, tracheitis, bovine viral diarrhea, pre-influenza 3, and bovine respiratory syncytial virus. And let's put lepto in there while we're at it. This is a common combination. And again, at least every six months. But you want to remember, there are a lot of vaccines out there that have only something like IBRPI3, IBRBVD, IBRPI3 plus lepto. 
And a lot of people who advise and dispense vaccines don't pay attention to the difference. And you want the producers looking out for all nine of these, okay, together. Coccidiosis. It's a, usually Imeria bovis and Imeria zernii, or zernii, sometimes called. Almost always in two months to one year old cattle, and we saw that. Classically, it's in hot summer or cold winter when temperature stress and crowding around water take place more. That's the classic time, but it's not limited to that. And particularly, feedlot animals with their concentrated numbers and conditions can have it any time of the year. It often causes a watery diarrhea that's mild for a few days, but it can be a very severe diarrhea. It can be bloody. It can be very chronic and almost look like red blood coming out. And intestinal mucous membranes can be shed in the feces. So if you look at the diarrheal feces, you'll see pieces of mucous membrane in there. Um, and amazingly, that, that doesn't always kill them. It can do anything from slowed weight gain to actual weight loss to stunting for life or death. And we confirm it by fecal filtration or direct smear of the feces and look at the oocysts, the, the eggs, to confirm it. And again, bedding, water, and feed, we wanna keep as clean as possible. The more we can like move feeders around, uh, move our troughs and things around is great. The more we can do something to keep them clean. And then I have this picture down here that I was looking for something of a bad fecal condition. This is actually a fairly recent legal case, an animal welfare case where uh, they wound up prosecuting someone over this deep uh, manure conditions here. Coccidiostats, the coquinate, amprolium, lasalicid, and menensin. And interestingly enough, these are antibiotics, but they're not considered medically important, which I agree with, they're not, for medically important for humans. So they still don't require a VFD or a veterinary feed directive and should consult the vet regarding which ones, the dosage and things like that. But having, having animals on coccidious, that's a pretty useful thing to do. Um, if you want, I'm gonna jump into something else in a minute and show you some pictures but I just wanted to mention, uh, Savannah had this slide, so I just point out very quickly, I hope you can see that these guys have not aged much, and you can see by these images right here, the agelessness of, of Dr. Baldwin, myself, and Dr. Stott. So just wanted to show you that. But also, this is Dr. Minenti, who's a resident from Italy, a very nice lady, and she is here doing a residency for board certification in pathology, but already has a PhD. And this is Dr. Michael Clayton, and out of 30 some grad students in ADBS, he's the only one with green on his picture. And I told him that must be Homeland Security or some kind of marker uh, looking out for him. But he's a very nice fella and he is working on a residency and a PhD. So there's a couple of our new residents. And I'd be glad to try to take some questions, but if you want